Welcome to the Two Men Out Christmas Special. Cricket, the 2015 edition, is coming kicking and screaming to an end. Now there is nothing Test Cricket has wanted more of late than the West Indies to roll back the years. And in the first test in Hobart against Australia, that is exactly what they did. Unfortunately, they didn't roll back quite enough of those years and only went back as far as the mid-2000s. They got mashed like a recently divorced chef's potatoes. For Australia, not the most wildly celebrated triumph, understandably, given that beating West Indies at home in a test match nowadays is an achievement akin to winning a speed hot dog eating race against a fossilised Tyrannosaurus Rex. A bit hollow and rather overshadowed by a feeling of regret about how good your opponent used to be. There was a mammoth partnership between Voges and Marsh, which is absolutely great news for the recent past of Australian cricket. Since we were last with you in Delhi, South Africa pulled off a staggeringly high tariff feat of cricketing gymnastics by combining a beyond Tavaray-esque, boycott-shaming, Kirsten out-Kirstening dead bat megablock with another rapid-fire collapse, genius, a heroic rearguard and an embarrassing defeat. How do they do it? It's like a margarita pizza with a slow-cooked beef stroganoff instead of tomato and raspberry trifle instead of mozzarella. A.B. de Villiers, the prime shot-making genius of the age, did not so much shut up shop as dismantled the entire South African retail sector. And when Umesh Yadav is going for nine runs of 21 overs, that is Umesh Yadav, who previous to this series had been to economical bowling what 19th century novelist Jane Austen was to professional snooker, you know something very, very weird is going on. Ajinkya Rahane rose above the general batting average slashing carnage of the series with two centuries uh, scored with a general air of, gentlemen, this is how you're supposed to do it. But many were not happy with the pitches, which uh, they thought were taking home advantage just too far. And in other news, New Zealand beat Sri Lanka in a good game. That's a bit unusually for December 2015 Test Cricket. Did not have people absolutely bricking themselves about what it all meant for the future of the Test Match game. So, Doc, Christmas special. Last show of the year. Party, party, party. It's a good tree there, Doc. Thank you, Frederick. I decorated it myself. Yes, I can see that. So, what are your highlights of the year? Well, Frederick, I would say 2015 in my book will always be remembered primarily as being the 100th anniversary of me popping my spectacular clogs. Everything else is, frankly, a footnote. Uh, winning the Ashes, a uh, nice little bonus. Yeah, but it wasn't a great series, was it, Doc? One-sided matches? Flawed, inconsistent teams, England winning none of their other three test series in the year. Must have been a bit of an empty experience. Yes, but as Woody Allen said, as empty experiences go... Hmm. Cricket is full of half thought out theories and the West Indies decline seems to attract as many if not more than most. Some blame Dwight York's feet, that's football Andy. Others Patrick Ewing's height, that's basketball. Money and professionalism have dogged the West Indies, uh, well, you know, for longer than those two things existed. Uh, when they were good or great or anything in between, their players made money from county cricket, English leads and Kerry Packer's bulging wallet. Glad I said wallet there, aren't you? Uh, with that money, they shaped Test Cricket, gave us our greatest dynasty, won the first two World Cups, and also delivered us India by losing the third one. Um, but still, for all that, their market size and their financial realities mean that they could never make big money. So the West Indies only have three avenues to money in modern cricket, really. That's playing India at home, which is hard when India and Australia never stop playing each other. Uh, the Caribbean Premier League, which obviously doesn't really appeal to people all around the world. And the third is the ICC funds from the World Cups and the like. Well, since the big, uh, the big Three's ICC takeover, over $30 million of that West Indies money is now no longer going to the West Indies. Of course, the ICC have pledged $1.25 million a year for Test Match Cricket to teams like the West Indies, which is less than what Chris Gale makes in eight weeks in the IPL. So how can they keep their players, support their players, fund their players, train their players if they can't pay their players. Modern cricket, Andy, is a space race, and the West Indies have a second-hand bottle rocket. I see that. There's an option four, but he's currently in jail in America. Here we have Andy Zaltzman, alleged batsman, unlicensed wicketkeeper, hindquarters like a well-cooked hamster, fast-twitch sarcasm, and the lung capacity of a bottle of ketchup. 
result of an unsuccessful 1970s covert government breeding program to produce the new Jack Hobbs. So, Doc, have England had a good year or a bad year? Uh, could I possibly answer that in three years' time when we can really know for sure? No, that might be the best time to answer it, uh, but for the sake of this show, I'm going to have to push you. Have England, Doc, had a good year or a bad year? Uh, yes, they, they have both uh, very bad and really quite good. Correct, Doc, uh, correct, ten points, well done. R rather like Australia's year in that regard. Yes, you, you, I suppose you could say that. I did say that, Frederick. No could about it. I did. Happy Christmas, everyone, if that's your bag. Happy New Year, I'll go with that. Andy? Yes. What did the West Indies need to do to improve? It's a very good question, Jared. Right, so to start with, I'd say as a short-term thing, they really need to get their senior players contributing more to the team. They need to you know, wake Marlon Samuels up. So that would help. Then, of course, I think they really need to get more of their top players playing in the Test match team. Uh, point 17, I would say that uh, you know their first-class structure is clearly not producing. And of course, you've got the West Indies cricket boards, and uh, really, Jared, you'd say the West Indies administration has been about as useful. Of course, you've got the problem of 2020, and you say the shortest format of the game has to be harnessed for the overall good of the sport. Uh, one more thing I I'd like to see, uh, and given the amount of uh, money in cricket now, this should be possible, is the construction of a time machine to take the entire planet. Personally, I believe the West Indies really need to create some form of magic serum that makes Garfield Sobers 21 years old again. So I'd say in summary, Jared, to wrap everything up, there clearly is a lot that the West Indies need to do if ever to get back to the very top of the test. Jared? Oh, God. I've really been talking too long. I, I, have, to, I, have, to, I have to leave. Jared, play my stat whack music. There have been 37 stumpings in 40 tests so far this year. That is the second most stumpings ever in a test match year. There were 41 in 2004, but in 51 tests. There have been 0.925 stumpings per test. That's the highest since 1956. 2.92% of all test dismissals so far this year have been stumped. Currently also the highest since 1956, although 1993 also had 2.92%, fractionally less, and unlikely to be many more stumpings. So, uh, the point is, 93 could overtake us. But this year so far, a stumping every 2,029 balls in tests. The most frequent stumpings rate since, you've guessed it, 1956. Lordy, take me home. Godfrey Evans, whip the bells off in your grave, old man. He's a great age. England are coming off beating an Australian team who believes all the way pitches are a form of cheating and uh, losing to Pakistan less badly than I believe that everyone thought they would. Uh, South Africa comes away from being drowned uh, against Bangladesh and then failing to bother with batting at all uh, against India. Dale Stain has shown on his Instagram this week that he's preparing for the series by taking his nieces out. Uh, do you think this will affect the series? Well, uh, it's interesting if you draw a graph of series before which Stain has taken members of his family out and those series in which he hasn't, it makes almost no difference uh, to the eventual outcome. So uh, I think his fitness might, if anything, be more important than whether or not he's taken his niches for a day out. As we see that with the latest score here, currently locked at nil-nil before the series has begun, I think it could be a really good series, Jared. Two flawed teams who've uh, explored inconsistency of late. Uh, I think it's going to be more than nil-nil by the end. Do you think Dale Steyn, nieces aside, uh, is going to be fit? And if so, can England beat Dale Steyn, nieces aside? Well, England have had quite a lot, a lot of luck with Dale Steyn over the years. He uh, only played half the series in 2008. He wasn't fit in 09-10. Uh, and 2012, when England lost the series 2-0, no one took any notice because the Olympics was on. So we've avoided the devastating Steyn who has annihilated other teams. Uh, but his fitness is cru crucial. In India, only played one test, no wickets. He basically had one bad series before that in uh, almost, what, eight, nine years. 
So, yeah, if he's good, I think South Africa will win. Up next is Jared Kimber, all-rounder, although not quite as all-rounder as he used to be. A lovely stride, frisky but not a sweater, and the stamina for the long journey, provided that long journey has a free lunch at the end of it. Seldom compared to the young Judy Garland, wireless, 3D. Andy, I'd like for the kiddies back home for you to be able to take everyone through the Angelo Matthews dismissal in as much detail, be as thorough as you need to be to really explain how Angelo Matthews was bowled in that second innings. My cracker, Jared. It's my cracker. Oh, excellent. I've got Alec Bannerman, the 19th century Australian stonewall batsman. Oh, and what's on my stat? Oh, this is a good one for Christmas. Did you know that John Reid of New Zealand and Madassa Nazar are the only test cricketers to have batting and bowling averages of the same number in the 30s? Now, Reid 33, bat and ball, Madassa Nazar 38. Happy Christmas. <laughs>